Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. More details have emerged from the Alberta budget and its impact on so many sectors in our province. Lethbridge Mayor Chris Spearman says fortunately the new budget will not impact our city's current infrastructure projects, including renovations to the airport. And we hear from the always colourful Brian Lilly, who says Canadians would rather pay a fine than stay at the federal government's designated quarantine hotels. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Robbins. Thanks so much for joining us. The Alberta government has reached a tentative agreement with our province's physicians. The Alberta Medical Association will now determine whether the agreement will proceed to a ratification vote by their 11,000 members. AMA officials say they are prepared to open voting immediately for a three-week period. Health Minister Tyler Shandro says the tentative agreement will allow for fiscal sustainability into the future while maintaining a strong focus on patient care and fairness and equity for physicians. The move comes nearly a year after the province ended its long-standing master agreement with doctors. New fee rules on extended patient visits were implemented in the spring. Now, the move caused some doctors to announce they would reduce services or even leave the province. The UCP eventually rolled back some fee and scheduling changes. AMA President Dr. Paul Boucher said the new agreement is an opportunity to restart a relationship with the government. Alberta's COVID-19 era budget is drowning in red ink with no relief in sight. The province has ran a $20.2 billion deficit in the fiscal year that ends at the end of March. Finance Minister Travis Tave says the province will run an $18.2 billion deficit this fiscal year. The province is on track to carry $98 billion in tax-supported debt this year, rising to more than $132 billion by the year 2024. The goal, however, is still to balance the books. Tave says keeping the net debt to GDP ratio below 30% is key moving forward. That's a critical ratio uh, because it, it really uh, indicates uh, a province's balance sheet strength and also the ability to raise government revenues based on the size of the economy. Uh, the uh, interprovincial average pre-COVID for net debt to GDP was 30%, and I, all the other provinces are going to go much, much higher as a result of COVID. Ours is going to go higher from what it otherwise was. We started the year out this year with about a 10% or 11% net debt to GDP ratio. Ours is going to go up over the course of this fiscal plan. It's going to go up to about 26% based on our plan, but we're going to keep it below 30%, which will ensure that we have a relatively strong balance sheet as we emerge, and that will be critical to fiscal recovery. The budget was delivered on promises to avoid tax increases in a province that has the lowest per capita tax regime in all of Canada. The new budget will also be impacting our post-secondary institutions in the province. It included a 6.2% reduction in operating support for Alberta's colleges and universities. These reductions are on top of the 10% reductions to the system over the past couple of years. The Council for Post-Secondary Presidents of Alberta says the recent cuts will transfer more financial responsibility onto the backs of students. It may also lead to further layoffs. In a statement today, the group's Executive Director Bill Weary had this to say. If the province is not able to find stable funding, it needs to remove restrictions preventing institutions from managing their current revenue sources, programming facilities and lands. The Alberta Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation says even though it was a tough pill to swallow with the budget, one thing the UCP did do well was to address what he says is overspending at post-secondary institutions. Franco Terrazano joins me now from Calgary. So Franco, you say the province got this part of the budget right? One of the good things that we are seeing in this budget is that the government is trying to make its universities and colleges more efficient. And our advanced education system has been wildly inefficient for a very long time. I mean, we're spending thousands of dollars more per student than other similar provinces. And you know what? The cupboards, the cupboards aren't so bare for these universities. We found freedom of information requests that showed thousands of university employees were receiving pay increases during lockdowns in 2020. So it's a good move from this government to make our universities and colleges more efficient. So Franco, overall, what was your impression of the budget and how will it really impact the average Alberta taxpayer? Big debt, big deficit, big spending. Wasn't a whole lot of good news 
for Alberta taxpayers in this budget. And you know what's so disappointing is that it seems like this government wasn't even really trying to find the necessary savings. I mean, we're seeing the government spend billions of dollars more even than the NDP in their final year. Um, you know, you know what's really frustrating? Families, businesses, we've all found ways to tighten our belts and have savings during the downturn. So why is it only that the Alberta government isn't finding the necessary savings? That was Franco Terrazano, the Alberta Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, joining me from Calgary. Lethbridge West MLA Shannon Phillips, who's also the NDP finance critic, was in Calgary today to discuss the Alberta government's new budget. Phillips says there wasn't enough done to support the trades specifically in the Stampede City. That will lead to the loss of construction jobs. The province had the chance to create 20,000 good paying trades jobs by approving the Green Line. But that was crickets from the UCP yesterday. Now, this would mean thousands of jobs for unemployed tra tradespeople in Calgary. And it is very unfortunate that the UCP has turned their backs on them in this budget. Now, the new budget also includes a reduction of funding to municipalities for local infrastructure projects. There will be a reduction of around 25% over the next few years. Lethbridge Mayor Chris Spearman says, fortunately, that will not have any impact on their current infrastructure projects here in our city for the time being. We're going to move ahead with our continued investments at the airport, uh, at, uh, in broadband infrastructure, in uh, downtown improvements, and uh, do what we can to uh, provide employment. One area that uh, we have some concerns about, of course, are uh, our social issues and addressing those. We uh, were granted $11.1 million for a supported housing project uh, two years ago. It was confirmed last year. Uh, we'd like to see that project move ahead and again create jobs in uh, the local economy. About a year ago, the former YMCA on Stafford Drive was demolished. The 60-year-old building still lives in areas of our community today as 98% of the materials have been reused and didn't go to the landfill. The city's facilities department has been working to conserve the scale since 2006 and facility services property managers say that this work is a good example of sustainable practices in Lethbridge. Lethbridge is kind of championing, championing this uh, on a municipal basis, level basis uh, pretty much throughout Western Canada we're probably one of the leaders in it. We set the goal on this one at 90%. Uh, it's an initiative for them to get out there and try and start finding uses in, in a variety of locations where they can reuse a lot of the elements. Um, it's also a benefit to them too because whatever, um, whatever they achieve monetarily out of selling or reusing those pieces is, uh, betters their bottom line. There are no other buildings in the city that require demolition, but the same process will be used when the time comes. After nearly a year of waiting, the Lethbridge Hurricanes will hit the ice tonight for their first game of the season. The Canes are taking on the Edmonton Oil Kings. Now the team has already faced quarantine, a short window of practice, and have patiently waited for the special moment to finally arrive. The biggest thing is just the urgency in each game. You know, uh, there's not a lot of games, like you said, compared to the usual season. So uh, each game is going to mean that much more and, and um, you know, it's worth more each game. So it's kind of exciting from that standpoint where um, you know, every night's going to be a big, big game for us. And uh, from a development standpoint, we just got to do things a little bit quicker. And, and we've been doing that. And uh, we're trying to get better every day. I think the boys are pretty excited. Um, you know, we haven't been this excited in a long time. You know, it's been a year. Uh, we all just want to play hockey. And uh, we're all ready to go, I think. The WHL has tested 177 people within the Hurricanes division for COVID-19 without a single positive result. For curling fans, Curling Alberta has launched a social media initiative called Share the Love Challenge. Albertans are encouraged to post messages of appreciation for those who made a big difference in their lives. Now within this challenge, Curling Alberta is hoping to generate awareness to their 50-50 draw that will provide pandemic relief to local curling clubs in the province. That we'll be hosting in conjunction with the events happening in the Calgary curling bubble right now. You know, with the first event underway, the Scotties Tournament of Hearts, uh, a brand that I think is, you know, household um, recognizable, we're finding it a bit more difficult than expected to gain the traction with raffle ticket buyers. 
And, you know, of course, we didn't know exactly what to expect. We were optimistic to at least start to generate momentum similar to what we've seen in the hockey world. So we're really hoping that this campaign will also encourage regular supporters of other raffles, such as NHL teams, um, and opportunities to share the love with curling as well. To purchase 50-50 tickets, you can visit the Curling Alberta website. Waterton Lakes National Park and the Guyana First Nation welcome back a number of bison over the past few weeks. As Mike Aquin explains now, bison are very important and play an integral part in helping to shape the grassland ecosystem around them. It's been three and a half years since the Kino wildfire in Waterton Lakes National Park and Parks Canada had to relocate the bison because of widespread fire damage to the park. And on February 19th, six bison were released into the park. So that means that there was there was a significant change in the in their plants, the vegetation presence and in the soils. And, and uh, because of those significant impacts, it's, it's taken um, the land a little while to to regrow, uh, the plants to regrow. The park is working with the Gaina First Nation to make a cultural bison herd as well. Earlier this month, they brought in an additional 40 bison to the First Nation. This also included a prayer ceremony. Being able to have that partnership and being able to work together towards um, conservation targets. Like, you know, we, we're contributing on a national level that helps these targets that Canada has set out and Alberta has set out for conservation world by having a bison herd that is going to be wild and free ranging and it'll help restore this land. Bison are known as a keystone species, which means that they benefit the landscape around them for plants and other animals. So some of the ways that plains bison influence the ecosystem um, include uh, grazing. They they influence the, the composition and the, the number, the density of grasses that are present in the ecosystem by the, the grazing that they do. Um, they cause some disturbance with their hooves, which might not seem like a positive thing, but it actually can be the way that the way that bison move through a landscape and work within a landscape. Parks Canada officials say that restoring bison to their natural habitats is a great opportunity to strengthen cultural ecological, and historical connections with the Blackfoot peoples in southwestern Alberta. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted thousands of Canadian businesses. Many have struggled to even survive. In Manitoba, at least 37 businesses have shut down in Winnipeg since the virus began wreaking havoc with their bottom lines. That's according to the downtown Winnipeg BRZ. Officials told City Council that 60% of businesses reported making less than half of their normal sales. They say around 70,000 people who normally work downtown no longer do. That has been devastating business owners who serve the downtown core. The Saskatchewan government says it is expanding rapid testing for COVID-19. The plan is to use such tests for people who don't have symptoms of the virus. Officials say the 700,000 rapid point of care tests can be used in different settings including walk-in or drive through sites. The tests will also be offered in long-term and personal care homes, shelters, detox facilities, group homes, and even in schools. We keep hearing more and more stories of Canadians being taken to quarantine hotels upon arriving back in Canada from international travel. Some Canadians, as we reported yesterday, have allegedly been sexually assaulted at some of those hotels. Political reporter Brian Lilly says there are other Canadians who are simply refusing to go to the hotels and instead opting to pay a fine. Some people have just said, you know what? I'm not going to spend $2,000 to be in a hotel for three days. I'll pay the fine that is about $860, I believe it is, and they're not being stopped by the cops. They are simply being ticketed. Well, the ticket is less than three days in the hotel. Now, if you do check into the hotel, some people have been saying, you know, there was a bit of you know pushback from the government saying, oh, don't worry, it won't be $2,000. Well, then we started getting bills sent to us at the Sun for $1,900. There's a big difference. It's only $1,900, not $2,000. Mr. Lilly will also discuss how Ottawa has quietly reopened the borders to allow, as he says, thousands of more illegal immigrants into our country. That's coming up in the second half of our program. Federal Auditor General Karen Hogan says government mismanagement could leave the Canadian Navy and Coast Guard without the ships to defend and protect our waterways. Hogan found delays in delivering new ships even before the pandemic began as Ottawa's multi-billion dollar national shipbuilding strategy flounders nearly a decade after it was first launched. The national shipbuilding strategy was slow to deliver the combat and non-combat ships 
that Canada needs to meet its domestic and international obligations for science and defence. I think that uh, the delays that we saw in, in this audit um, should really be seen as a shared responsibility between both the government and the shipyards. Uh, so what we found is that there were delays in um, designing and determining um, the capabilities that were needed. Then there were delays in production. Um, and uh, the government didn't do a very good job at following up on shipyards meeting their uh, target state. Now, Hogan didn't stop there. She also blasted the federal government for not providing the support to ensure First Nations communities have access to safe drinking water. She says Indigenous Services Canada failed to meet its commitment to eliminate all long-term drinking water advisories, with 60 still in effect as of last fall. Despite committing to do so by March 2021, Indigenous Services Canada did not meet the government's commitment to remove all long-term drinking water advisories for public systems in First Nations communities. During our audit, we noted that the funding formula had not been updated in 30 years. Um, you, you should look at things uh, a little more often than 30 years. I think that it's a good measure to, to check things on a, on, a, on a much more regular basis. Um, we saw that the funding formula wasn't meeting the current needs, um, let alone perhaps future needs that might be there. And one of the key factors that was highlighted was that system operators are currently uh, earning about 30% less than their counterparts in other parts of the country. And hence, retention is very difficult. Well, it was another mild day in the Windy City once again. We were well above zero and not a bad weekend is shaping up either. Full weather details are coming up. It was another mild day in the city. Lethbridge is feeling more and more like spring weather here, isn't it? Now, there's something special here that our senior producer, Renee, shot earlier today. Check this out. Look who came to visit at the corner of 18th Street and 14th Avenue North. A few deer were spotted munching and moving slowly through the area. It seems that the deer like to come out searching for food during the warmer temperatures. So please make sure you slow down around the city as quite a number of deer have been spotted. Now, just not at the north end, but also along Bridge Drive on the west side. Jeanette Rocher is here now with a complete look at the weather forecast. Jeanette, will the spring-like temperatures we've been enjoying stick around for the weekend? Well, I was going to say, I certainly hope those deer stick around. They're so cute. We had some in our driveway just the other day as well. But as far as spring-like conditions, we're going to be looking more like winter-like conditions tonight and into tomorrow, uh, two to four centimeters of the white stuff expected overnight tonight and into Saturday, 60% uh, chance of flurries. Uh, minus four is the high for Saturday. Then we're going to climb to nine degrees on Sunday. That's when that spring-like feeling is going to come back at us. Windy conditions though as well. As we get into Monday, we get those double digits of high of 11 degrees and then nine degrees is our high for our Tuesday, Wednesday and next Thursday with a mix of sun and cloud. So as we see that temperature rise into those pluses, that's certainly taking us out of this range higher than the average uh, for this time of year, which is three. Our average low for this time, minus nine, 20 was the high temperature on this day back in 1992. And in 1947, we had our chilliest day on record, which was minus 34. Sun rose this morning at 720 and our sunset this evening will be at 608. So let's take a look at the rest of the country. West Coast uh, coming out of wind warnings. Uh, they had warning uh, wind up to 90 kilometers per hour, but not so much tomorrow. Nine degrees the high in Victoria, five in Vancouver, minus four in Edmonton and minus six in Calgary. Both Edmonton and Calgary will be experiencing flurries this evening and that should be dissipating overnight. So should just be a nice day tomorrow with a mix of sun and cloud. Looking at the rest of the prairies, minus 11 the high for Saskatoon, minus 10 for Regina, periods of snow expected there. Winnipeg getting a mix of snow and rain, minus 14 the high there. So their temperature is certainly dropping compared to what it was a day or two ago. Looking to the central part of the country here, Toronto risk of freezing rain with a mix of rain and snow throughout the day. Seven the high, five the high for both Ottawa and Montreal as those cities also will be getting rain mixed with some snow. Looking into Atlantic Canada, Fredericton also experiencing periods of snow mixed with rain. Um, two degrees the high there, one in Halifax, zero the high in Charlottetown, minus five in St. John's, Newfoundland. St. John's of course experiencing the snow squall warning today. Saturday should be fine, but then there's a 
a low pressure system coming into that area to bring them lots of snowfall for Sunday. So it should be an interesting weekend in St. John's. There you go. That is your forecast. Stay tuned for the ski report. Today's weather is brought to you by ColumbianDirect.com. Cafe Coffee, specialty coffee from our family to yours. Castle Mountain has seen a huge snowfall over the past 72 hours of 42 centimeters, increasing to a 124 centimeter base. Nakiska received 10 centimeters of snow with a 114 centimeter base. Sunshine Village saw 8 centimeters of fresh powder over the past 72 hours and has a 198 centimeter base. And no new snow for Lake Louise, which has a 151 centimeter base. At Mount Norquay, no new snow has fallen over the past 72 hours, leaving a 127 centimeter base. In BC, Panorama has seen 1 centimeters of the white stuff and they have a 78 centimeter base. Fernie received 21 centimeters of new snow and has a 100 centimeter base. And Kimberly hasn't received any fresh powder within the last 72 hours, but retains an 80 centimeter base. And that's a look at your Bridge City News Ski Report. The federal deficit soared to just over $248 billion in the first nine months of the 2020-2021 fiscal year. That dwarfs the $11 billion shortfall in the same period a year earlier. Ottawa says the massive deficit reflects the deterioration of the economy and its response plan to the pandemic. Program spending ballooned from $230.5 to almost $429 billion. Revenue dropped to almost $208 billion for the April to December period. That is down from $246 billion as tax and other revenue fell. Imperial Oil says it is cutting a billion barrels from its inventory following a year marked by lower oil prices and budget cutting during the pandemic. There was also a global price war between the major oil producers. The Calgary-based company says it proved plus probable bitumen reserves fell by almost 4.5 billion barrels as the end of December. In Airbnb's first financial report since becoming a public company, it posted a loss of $3.9 billion during the fourth quarter. The home sharing site was hurt by lockdowns during the pandemic and recorded costs for becoming a public company. It is taking a charge of $2.8 billion for stock compensation related to the IPO. Airbnb declined to offer a forecast for 2021 profit and revenue. Company executives say they're upbeat about a recovery, but said the unknown pace of vaccinations makes it difficult to know how quickly people will be willing to travel. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 163 points in the day to finish at 18,060. The Dow was down 469 points to 30,932. The S&P 500 was down 18 points to 3811. And the NASDAQ was up 72 points to 13,192. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down $2.03 to $61.50 US per barrel. Natural gas was down a cent to $2.77 US. Gold was down $36.52 to $17.3404 US an ounce. And silver was down 76 cents to $26.67 US an ounce. Wheat is at $303 per metric ton. Barley's at $306. Canola's at $764. And corn is at $341 per metric ton. Live cattle were down 390 to 113.10. Feeder cattle were down a buck 75 to 138.68, and lean hogs were down 260 to 87.15. The Canadian dollar was down slightly over the past 24 hours to 78.50 U.S. Recapping one of our top stories this hour, Alberta's COVID-19 era budget is drowning in red ink with not much relief in sight. The province says it ran a $20.2 billion deficit in the fiscal year that ends on March 31st. Finance Minister Travis Taves says the province will run an $18.2 billion deficit this fiscal year. The province is on track to carry $98 billion in tax-supported debt this year, rising to more than $132 billion by the year 2024. It appears as though Canadian travellers would rather spend $800 on a fine than the $2,000 tab to stay three days at a quarantine hotel. Political reporter Brian Lilly has a story for us in just a moment. Many countries around the world are slowly reopening for business. Some regions of Italy are now open. Israel says it's going to be opening in April and Britain in June. As for Canada, our chief medical officer of health says we should be able to reduce some public health measures by September. To discuss this in more detail is political reporter Brian Lilly joining me once again from Toronto. Brian, why is Canada lagging so far behind? It comes down to one word, vaccines. 
you know, you know, the old real estate term is location, location, location. Right now it's vaccines, vaccines, vaccines. But even beyond that, Dr. Teresa Tam, the chief medical officer who said, you know, if more people getting vaccinated will be a good thing. She was still saying, but we're still going to have to keep wearing masks and social distancing and thinking, okay, at what point do we get to be normal again? At what point do we get to see family and friends, hug a loved one that doesn't live in our own home? go to a restaurant, go to opening day. You know, Israel's gonna be opening up around the time that the Blue Jays should be having opening day at Rogers Center here in Toronto. I had tickets for last year's event to go, didn't get to go, don't get to go this year. Who knows when that sort of thing will come back, but other countries are getting back to normal because they have adequate supplies of vaccine. And the Trudeau government has been thumping its chest quite a bit this week because we've got the biggest order ever, 643,000 combined Pfizer and Moderna doses showing up, Hal. Or as Joe Biden likes to say, what they use before lunch in the United States, because they're doing between one and a half and two million doses a day. If you don't think that it's right to compare Canada to the United States, pick one of the other 46 countries ahead of us in line in terms of vaccinating the percentage of their population. On a per capita basis, we're at 48th right now. You know, we haven't been out of the 40s in about two weeks now. We, we bounce around a little bit, but, you know, we're not in a spot where a G7 nation should be. And so we're going to continue living without our uh, ability to, to go to festivals and concerts and all the things that make summer great. You know, that's being canceled. Every major event until July 2nd in the city of Toronto has been canceled. And listening to the uh, health officials here, don't expect them to suddenly turn on the uh, the event lights on July 2nd. Well, here in Lethbridge, the Whoop Up Days was cancelled. The legendary Calgary Stampede was cancelled. Calgary's my hometown. I grew up there. And Brian, we still don't have the Canadian Football League. The, the Canadian Football League, the CFL, your tie cats, my stamps. I mean, we something has to give here eventually. And l let me ask you something. Have the Liberals been talking potentially about helping out the CFL? I can't see them surviving if they're going to be shut down again this season. You know, they, I don't believe the issue has uh, gone that far ahead so far this year. Uh, there were discussions last year uh, that didn't go very far. There isn't a lot of appetite in Canada for um, politicians handing out money to professional sports athletes, even if, the, you know, in the CFL, a lot of them are not making very much money. I think that it might be popular in uh, Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Not sure how well it would play in Alberta, but probably better than here uh, in Ontario or in British Columbia, where I doubt it would, uh, would receive an awful lot of support. Last year, when they were looking at playing in a bubble, Manitoba and Saskatchewan were trying to outbid each other to get the league to show up there. So there is some support across the prairies, but overall, not a lot of support for taxpayers' dollars going into that sort of thing. Well, you can be sure here in Alberta between the Stampeders and the Edmonton Football Club, we want to get that rivalry going once again here. Now let's get back to the vaccines for just a moment, Brian. There's been a lot of back and forth between Ottawa and the provinces when it comes to the rollouts. Trudeau says he was frustrated with doses being in freezers instead of people's arms, while the premiers say they were frustrated by a lack of the vaccines. Now the deliveries are picking up, are provinces keeping up? Yes and no. I mean, they're starting to ramp back up. Remember, they went down to near zero. At one point, I had an Alberta official tell me that on a given Sunday, they had vaccinated, I think it was 75 people. Ontario's lowest day was about 2,200 uh, people from what should have been 25,000 a day and climbing. You know, so they were going up, 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 and then suddenly went down to just over 2,000 in the province of Ontario. The the biggest province in the country population-wise, the place with 40% of the country's population handing out next to no vaccines. Well, they've got to ramp it back up. So yes, you know, when you look at percentage of doses used, Ontario, Alberta, uh, Saskatchewan are all tend to be pretty high in the 80, mid 80s to 90% of doses used. But that's a rotating cycle. The doses are coming in, they're going out the door, you know, in order to use as many as are coming in, Ontario has to, by this weekend, be up to about 25,000 doses a day. Uh, retired General Rick Hillier tells me he'll be there. Speaking with the Saskatchewan and Alberta governments, they're telling me that they're going to be ramping up as well, that they will get there. So 
Uh, unfortunately, though, after several rough weeks for the prime minister, a lot of his supporters online are saying, why are premiers leaving doses in freezers? Well, you can't get a, a delivery on Wednesday night and on Thursday morning expect that you're going to have hundreds of thousands of doses administered by the morning. But it's become very political. The liberals took a, the Trudeau liberals took a big shot on this. Uh, it hasn't worked out well for them. They would like to go towards a spring election still, I think. And so expect more shots to be taken from Ottawa at premiers, including by members of the, the party, not just their friends and trolls on Twitter. Brian, the rule requiring people entering Canada to quarantine for at least three days at a hotel has not got off to a very good start. Now, some people are refusing to, and there are other reports that other people have allegedly been sexually assaulted when they were forced to quarantine, and the Conservatives are calling for a scrap of the hotel quarantine altogether. Yeah, I mean, let's start off with the, um, uh, the, the least serious of these. Yeah, some people have just said, you know what? I'm not going to spend $2,000 to be in a hotel for three days. I'll pay the fine that is about $860, I believe it is. And they're not being stopped by the cops. They are simply being ticketed. Well, the ticket is less than three days in the hotel. Now, if you do check into the hotel, some people have been saying, you know, there was a bit of you know pushback from the government saying, oh, don't worry, it won't be $2,000. Well, then we started getting bills sent to us at the Sun for $1,900. There's a big difference. It's only $1,900, not $2,000. But people are, are getting their tests back and they test negative. So they're allowed to leave. Well, they've maybe only spent a day, a day and a half in the hotel. They say, can we get some of our money back? And the answer is no. Now, on the most serious problem, two different incidents of alleged sexual assault, one in the Montreal area, one in the Toronto area, uh, police in Halton, which is the suburban area just to the west of Toronto's Pearson Airport, they're now investigating claims of a sexual assault at a hotel by someone who was hired to work security there. A similar incident happening in Montreal. So yes, a number of uh, conservative MPs, including Michelle Rempel Garner, uh, Tamara Jensen, and others saying, you know, uh, Shannon Stubbs, it's time for this to end. It's time to to put a stop to this. This move went far beyond what most of the premiers had been calling for. They'd been calling just for testing at airports, some real restrictions to make sure that people were quarantining properly. And the government went from saying travel's not an issue and mocking the idea that you had to be worried about people traveling into the country with COVID to suddenly saying, we're going to have this big apparatus and it's going to cost you big time. I think they did overkill and I don't think they were ready for what they've wrought on the Canadian public. After pausing immigration to our country during the pandemic, it appears as though the federal Liberals are quietly admitting record numbers of people into the country once again. Tell me a bit more about that. They're looking at admitting more than 400,000 people this year. Now, of course, they paused immigration. That, that was supposed to be their goal last year. But they paused it saying, look, we're, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Large swaths of the economy are shut down. Uh, millions upon millions of Canadians lost their jobs. There were more than 2 million unemployed and I believe 2 million underemployed, people who had lost significant hours of work. And, and so they said it just doesn't make sense. Well, the unemployment rate is still very high. So I'm not sure why at this point, when we are worried about new variants coming in from other parts of the world, when we are worried about the hundreds of, or not hundreds of thousands, but millions of Canadians that remain unemployed, why we've suddenly decided quietly to start ramping up. So we're looking at 400,000 people this year. Uh, the numbers in January were more than 26,000. And that is significantly higher than the same period last year. And the fe uh, federal liberals, including Immigration Minister Marco Mendocino, say they will continue to ramp it up. I'm not sure that Canadians know that this is what's happening yet. And I'm not sure that it would get the same sort of buy-in that it normally does. Canadians, regardless of political stripe, tend to support immigration, um, but they do have some questions about it in the middle of a pandemic when there are so many unemployed, when people simply can't get to work, and when the recovery will take quite a bit of time. Is it even right to uh, the immigrants coming in to say, yeah, come on into Canada. There's a good chunk of our economy shut down. Try and find your way in that. It's going to be tough for all sides in this. 
Now, do you think perhaps potentially the Liberals are thinking of more votes? That's why they're letting him in. And the reason I ask that is many European families that I talked to many years ago, when Pierre Elliott Trudeau, his father, let in a lot of immigrants, said, you know, we're always going to vote Liberal because they took care of us and our family, and we're going to pass that on for generations to our kids. Maybe is there a similar mindset now with Justin? There is a bit of that. And look, every uh, party in power has used immigration as a, as a vote getter in terms of how they change the immigration system. The conservatives under both Stephen Harper and Brian Mulroney did the same thing. But, uh, you know, they wouldn't get those votes for some time. What they would still get are the votes of the organizers in various immigrant and ethnic communities who are now citizens and are able to vote. That's whose votes they will continue to get and continue to rely on. And then, of course, yes, they do you know, try and, uh, and bring people along for the years to come. Wouldn't be immediate, but they would be able to uh, rely on some communities to continue supporting them. Brian, the medical assistance and dying bill is back before the House of Commons after being amended in the Senate. Now, critics say it's still a bill that greases up the slippery slope for assisted suicide for people with mental illness. Yeah, Senator Denise Batters, who lost her husband, Dave. He was a, a conservative MP, um, died of suicide many years ago. And she is one of the, the main advocates in Parliament saying this is heading in the wrong direction. But, you know, she's not alone. Uh, MP Michael Cooper, uh, Tamara Jensen, Michael Barrett, several of them are getting together to say, look, this has to, to change. All of this started um, the changes that are, are being debated of, on medical assistance and dying over a court challenge. And it was a lower court. The government could have challenged it. They could have appealed the ruling, but they didn't because it fit with where they wanted to take it. Remember, the medical assistance and dying was brought about by a, a, a different court challenge. They had to find a way to meet the Supreme Court's ruling. Now they're trying to meet a lower court ruling and there's a bit of back and forth. There was hope that some of the um, elements that would open it up for mental illness to be a, a consideration would be taken out in the Senate. That didn't happen. Now they're going to try and take it out in the House of Commons. I don't have a lot of hope. Uh, it seems like this is the direction that Parliament is going to go one way or another. But this is the slippery slope that so many of us did warn about when this became an issue years ago. Yeah, Alex Schadenberg from Euthanasia Prevention Coalition is still horrified by what's transpired with this bill. A Liberal MP who introduced a bill for a guaranteed universal income, Brian, says she now has the support from some cabinet ministers. Can we expect to potentially see this in the Trudeau government's March budget? Well, if they really do want to go to the polls, this might be one of the things that they talk about. I wouldn't expect to see it fully endorsed. Uh, the Liberal MP in question is from the middle of Toronto, right on the Danforth. Her name's Julie Zersowitz, and she won't say how many cabinet ministers support it, but there are many. I wouldn't be surprised if Christia Freeland, the finance minister, supports it. Uh, her book is behind me on the shelf somewhere, and she endorses an awful lot of very left-wing um, political uh, causes and economic issues in her book, Plutocrat. So uh, I could definitely see Freeland doing that. The prime minister has not warmed to the idea so far, but my theory, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, is that they're hoping to get just enough vaccines to look after people in nursing homes and to start bringing down the number of deaths and hospitalizations, bring in a good news budget at the end of March, and then shortly after Easter say, we need to build back better, and the prime minister will say he needs a new mandate to do that. So we could see a, a hint at something like a universal basic income in the budget, like we've seen hints from the Liberals saying, we're going to bring in Pharmacare, and we're going to bring in a national childcare program. If they keep bringing in all these programs, I don't know what any of us will be paying for anymore out of our own pockets, but they keep talking about it, but not delivering. In fact, just this week, the Liberals voted against an NDP bill on bringing in a national Pharmacare program. Brian, we only have a few moments left here, but I wanted to talk to you about this here. Canada's new top military commander stepped aside following a claim of sexual misconduct Admiral Art McDonnell is now under investigation by the Canadian military's National Investigative Service. Yeah, and this happening shortly after he took over, and shortly after he took over from uh, retired uh, General Jonathan Vance, Jonathan Vance was named as someone who was being investigated for past misconduct involving female subordinates. Now, an incident that took place on a ship in 2010 
Um, we don't know any details other than uh, there is some uh, speculation in the media that alcohol was involved, and that's it. That's all we know. Uh, now we've got the previous ch uh, chief of defense staff under investigation. We've got the current chief of defense staff under investigation, and questions about whether the military has ever taken the issue of uh, the treatment of women in the military seriously when they've come forward. Uh, it, it doesn't appear so if the most recent top two guys wouldn't have you know, pass the, the test that they wanted to put everyone else through. Political reporter and columnist for the Toronto Sun, Brian Lilly, thanks again for your time today. Thank you, Hal. Do you need some health advice? Well, today's guest regularly sees patients who struggle with many different health conditions. Dr. Clayton Cogano, a naturopathic doctor in Lethbridge with Well Vitality Health Clinic. He also has training in conventional medicine with a Bachelor of Science in exercise science, kinesiology, and three years of research on radiation and cancer at the University of Lethbridge. Dr. Cogan, welcome back to BCN. Thank you for having me again. Now, first of all, talk about your approach to finding solutions for the health struggles so many of us face on a daily basis. Well, I guess in my office, I see a lot of different various things. You always want to try and get to the root cause of the problem when they come in, because a lot of patients that I see have been unable to figure out what's wrong with them. And so the very first thing that I want to do is sit down with them, with a, take a long time to go through all of their health history, all their medical history, all their labs. And you want to kind of sort through all of that and then figure out from there a plan moving forward. A lot of time it's history taking and then further to that, further lab testing, either more in-depth lab testing or even just your general lab testing that just wasn't done. Often you can figure it out. Now, you've said that in your daily practice, you sometimes come across chronic fatigue with a lot of your patients now. How common is chronic fatigue in today's society, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic? Honestly, people put too much on their plates. Uh, people are very busy. Uh, that's one of the main reasons for chronic fatigue. There's a lot of other reasons, but it is extremely common in my practice. Yeah. But what are some of the causes of chronic fatigue? Like you said, being very busy, not getting enough rest, perhaps? Yeah, and it, it kind of compiles onto other things. Um, when stress is elevated, often people aren't sleeping well. Um, sometimes people can have other issues like perhaps low B12, um, blood sugar regularities, low iron. So it's important to, in my, in my opinion, even thyroid issues. And sometimes thyroid issues can get missed. So it's important to test things and test things in depth um, and look at the complete history of what's going on and what's been going on in order to figure it out. So what are some of the effective treatments outside of B12 and maybe cutting some of the stress out of our lives? Well, it completely varies. Like um, a lot of times if someone's having trouble sleeping, you have to try and start figuring out why they can't sleep. If someone has, for example, a lot of stress, you can't just tell them, to quit work if work is their big stressor. You have to try and figure out ways to work around it against the grain sometimes. Um, so the first thing is to figure out what's wrong. For example, if it was a cortisol issue, which tends to be the case with a lot of patients with chronic stress leading to chronic fatigue, a lot of times you will wanna treat that with different vitamins and herbs and then as that improves, you want to double check that you're not missing anything. Like perhaps that person also has low iron or their thyroid isn't working properly. You, want, you have to treat the whole person in order to fix chronic fatigue. Otherwise, you'll get a patient that gets about 50% better and then plateaus. You know, other people I've spoken to as well in the healthcare professionals saying, you know, uh, focusing on God's word and meditating and breathing helps a lot as well. How about certain foods? when it comes to stress? Are there certain foods yeah, as well that you can eat that can really help? Um, I mean, lifestyle change is massive. It is massive. It is also probably one of the most difficult things to for me to help someone with. I mean, you can tell people all, all day long to do something here and do something there, but ultimately that's the hardest thing for me because it's up to them when they go home to do it. Um, in terms of foods, yes, absolutely. Eating a healthful diet, eating a whole food diet, um, even looking into food sensitivities, that can create a ton of fatigue in people if they're battling the food that they're eating all the time. So it's important, again, to look into things and take a complete history, 
Um, because what I find actually is clinically people that are coming in, they're coming in with bags of supplements and they're still tired. And it's often, it's not a supplement deficiency in people. It's a multitude of system failures that's causing it. And you have to figure it out. Dr. Cogano, many people also go through bouts of insomnia. They just can't get any sleep. What do you think causes that? Is it a big part of it is not putting your phone down when you go to bed at night? Again, yeah, a lot of lifestyle changes. Um, yes, there absolutely is. A lot of people don't prepare for bed. You know, they have their TV in their bed, they're on their phone. It's, it's a social area now versus an area just for sleep. And so that is a huge thing. There's other reasons as well for insomnia. And insomnia, is, it can be a tricky thing. Um, sometimes breathing issues like sleep apnea can create patients that just don't get a restful sleep or, or not at all. Um, anxiety is a huge thing. And that goes hand in hand with chronic fatigue um, and chronic stress in general leads to a lot of anxiety uh, in which we can help a lot with. And then there's other things like for example, different neurological um, issues with the brain. Now, unfortunately, we can't test those. So that would be like, for example, uh, a slight deficiency of melatonin or a slight deficiency of GABA, which is uh, a neurotransmitter in your brain that stops the busy signal. But we don't know if it's one or the other or something else. And so in those cases, we have to guess with different herbs, different vitamins to try and fix it. Often you can, but it takes a couple tries for sure. You know, I remember years ago, my doctor told me, yeah, the herbs and the vitamins are good, but also at the same time, some warm milk. Is that still applied today or maybe reading a book to help somebody fall asleep if you suffer from insomnia? Oh yeah, like, well, I think the warm milk thing is more calming, right? I, I think, I don't know about that one, but I know that certain herbs like, you know, chamomile, chamomile tea is really calming. Rosemary is very calming. Uh, passion flower root specifically, you can drink it as a tea, you can take it as a supplement. They, it, it just makes you calm. It doesn't necessarily put you to sleep, but it helps get your body ready for sleep. Ever consider using CBD oil or capsules as a treatment for insomnia? Mm. Yeah, CBD, um, it's, a, it's a fairly new thing. Uh, especially since our, the legalization process, a lot of, a lot of uh, doctors are now delving into more research on it. Some of the research is promising on CBD for quite a lot of things, neurological things especially. So I think in certain cases, of, for example, neurological insomnia, where there might be a brain chemical imbalance, something going on, it may be prove benefit. And more research, the jury is still kind of out on it. Um, and in, in some cases, it's been shown to actually make sleep worse. And some people will actually get anxiety on it. Uh, and so I think it's, an, it's a potential option for people, but they definitely should talk to their doctor about it before they just go start taking anything, really. Uh, you want to be focused and, and accurate on what you're taking. Um, that way, um, you, you end up just with better results overall. Let's move on right now and talk about digestive health, Dr. Cogano, and let's talk specifically sure. about the condition called leaky gut. What exactly is leaky gut? Leaky gut is the general term for something called intestinal permeability, increased intestinal permeability. And what that means is that the enterocytes or the cells in your small intestine are slightly inflamed and irritated, and they're allowing larger protein particles of food to get into your bloodstream. And when a big piece of protein gets into your bloodstream, your body's not used to it. It's used to it being broken down to a certain size. So it, it sees it as foreign and it starts to kind of attack it and it can create an inflammatory response called an immunoglobulin response. And that can have widespread systemic effects on the body, meaning you could get anything from rosacea, eczema, psoriasis, acne, to chronic fatigue, to joint pain, to gut pain, to IBS. And so the, the testing for something like that is, I find very beneficial to helping people who have a multitude of symptoms, especially those with gut issues like IBS, because 
irritable bowel syndrome is a diagnosis that doesn't tell anyone what the problem actually is. Most patients come into the office knowing their gut's irritated. So me telling them that they have irritable bowel syndrome does not help anyone. We have to try and figure it out. And one way to figure it out is through a blood test called an IgG blood test that can actually start looking at, oh, maybe what foods uh, is this person sensitive to, to help them. So what are some of the effective treatments for leaky gut? Um, I Honestly, the first biggest thing is to try and figure out what foods or what um, product is irritating their gut and eliminate it. You have to get rid of the cause of the irritation. Sometimes the cause of the irritation is something more severe like inflammatory bowel disease, like an autoimmune thing, uh, maybe like celiac or heavy metal exposure, perhaps even antibiotics. So you got to get rid of whatever thing is irritating it first, and then you have to start working to heal the gut. And often I use a combination of L-glutamine and a high dose of omega-3, specifically a component in that called EPA, which is an anti-inflammatory. So you want a nice strong anti-inflammatory in the gut, and then you want glutamine, which helps to heal and bind the gut cells back together. Now, there are many body cleanses in the market today. What do you think of those which claim to really cleanse your liver? Um, I think that there's overclaim to what a lot of them can do. I think that some will have benefit, but you also have to be careful. I just saw a patient just the other day that did a liver cleanse and ran into some serious issues because her liver wasn't need, did one, didn't need it. And honestly, she even had some liver issues. I think that liver detoxes, and, and well, she didn't know, right? And so um, it ended up being, being an issue. I think you have to be cautious with it, but I think that the, the, general, um, the general idea behind it is, uh, positive. I think really it's it's meant to detoxes, especially in the liver, are meant to improve circulations, maybe give your organs a little bit of a rest, improve toxic elimination because that's what the liver does. So yes, you can absolutely do that. Um, provide your body with better nutrients um, and even just increase in circulation, you know, and, and really that's what a detox should be all about is in improving health, not depleting the body of a bunch of things. We talk about alcohol potentially damaging the liver. How about certain foods that may have the same effect? Um, yes, absolutely. There's a lot of different foods that can, can damage the liver. Um, certainly you want to make sure that you're eating a healthful diet and a whole foods diet. And I find that the biggest thing is variety in, in, the, in the diet because the liver itself is like a giant filter. So the more healthy whole foods, antioxidant foods that you're eating, the better it's going to function. So a lot of the, berries, blueberries, raspberries, right? That really helps? Exactly, exactly. The, the nice thing about the liver is it, unless, it is one of the only things in your body that can regenerate. So if it's down to a quarter functionality, it will regenerate to 100%. But the biggest catch-22 with that is that often what we see is that people that have a liver capacity that's so low, they're often alcoholics or they're drug addicts or they have issues that they cannot stop. So it often continues the decline. However, if you start treating your body health, healthfully, then that is one organ that can regenerate. When is a good time for a detox? Any symptoms to look for that would signal that you need to do a detox? And I'm not talking about drugs or alcohol specifically here. Oh, yeah. Um, so in terms of timing, often if I'm going to tell a patient to do a detox, because detoxes can be a little bit depleting, um, often I say spring or summer. Uh, I find a lot of people are already fatigued, extra fatigued in the winter. There's more disease going around, more influenza. Um, and so you want to make sure that your body, you're more boosting your body up in the winter. I think that spring and, and summer, you're a little bit more um, energetic. The, you know, your body's a little bit better to handle something like that. Um, so timing wise, that's definitely when you want to be doing them. Yeah. What are some of the benefits of probiotics 
there are different doses of probiotics. Now, do you go for one with, with the most? Um, no, you have to be careful with probiotics. Um, it's also sort of an area that we don't fully understand yet in medicine. It's a fairly new thing in medicine, probiotics. Um, we know that they're beneficial and they have lots of health benefits, but the, the microbiome in our gut is extremely complex. And there's certain times where you don't want to take a probiotic. For example, when I'm doing a gut healing protocol for leaky gut, right? I often now don't give a probiotic with it. And the reason is, is because sometimes people with gut issues also have other things along with it, perhaps candida, which is yeast or fungal overgrowth, or even something else called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO. And if the person has those things and we haven't tested them to rule them out, then a probiotic actually would make those conditions worse and it would actually make the person feel worse. But by and large and in general, um, a probiotic for most people is safe, it's effective, um, it can boost up your immune system, um, and you don't need a massive quantity. A lower dose of probiotic typically is just fine, and you just want a multi-strain. Uh, so often you want to replete it with 11 to 12 billion or 11 to 12 different types of bacteria. Dr. Clayton Cogano, naturopathic doctor in Lethbridge with Well Vitality Health Clinic. Thanks for your time today. Thank you so much, Al. Take care. You too. On behalf of all of us here at BCN, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless, and thanks so much for watching.